Hi, I'm Stephen Rauch. Well, I'm going to go into a little history of a little bit of everything involving iron ore, process involved, uh, why the 10 plate stove was made, uh, the progression of the to the 10 plate stove, and the uh, iron history in the area. So here's uh, the very basics about iron. Iron was uh, first produced somewhere between 5 and 9 BC in China, or iron ore was produced into uh, malleable iron, and that was the basis for cannons and uh, swords and uh, other metal tools. So as the uh, Silk Road uh, trade took place, the iron, um, what do you want to call it, industry moved along with it uh, to southern Europe and then up through Germany and then into uh, Great Britain and uh, finally into the, the colonies. Uh, now iron was uh, mined or the iron ore was mined in uh, southern Pennsylvania predominantly, although there were other ore deposits throughout the uh, the colonies, but the very early ones were right in this area, southern uh, Pennsylvania or southeastern Pennsylvania and in New, into New Jersey. Um, the ore was extracted, and then if you look at some of the information here on the board, um, the washeries were set up near the iron ore deposits where they washed the ore before it was used in a blast furnace to produce iron. Now the people that were responsible for producing the iron were the iron masters. Uh, when they uh, came up with the composition of the materials used in, in producing the iron, uh, they were very knowledgeable. They went through an apprenticeship and uh, a lot of it was trial and error to come up with the right uh, um, temperatures and consistency to either make a cast iron or a wrought, wrought iron or malleable iron. And that had to do with the amount of carbon that was in the ore. When they uh, produced the pig iron, which was the first step in the process, what they used was limestone, silica, charcoal, and the ore itself. And they produced that under, under a high heat, which in turn uh, worked to produce uh, the molten iron. Uh, as the iron was uh, emptied out of the furnace, when it became liquid, uh, they ended up with what was called pig iron. And the reason they called it pig iron was because when it was poured onto the floor in small molds, um, there was a tray set up where there were a, a bunch of these ingots left, which looked like little pigs. So that's why they called it pig iron. The major portion of the uh, iron industry in the uh, Americas, or what do you want to call the colonies, was done in the late 1700s and up until the mid 1800s. Uh, that's where a lot of the uh, advancements were made. Previous to that, most of the uh, technology and the information was brought from England or Germany. Uh, so any of the uh, uh, information was passed on to the iron uh, masters and as time progressed uh, they got better and better as far as as their procedures and the metallurgy itself was concerned. Um, as I said before pig iron was a very crude iron it had a very high carbon content and it was very brittle so it broke very easily so what happened was the pig iron was transferred to either one of the furnaces or foundries in the area which were much larger and the uh, pig iron would be remelted and then uh, reused to make either a wrought iron or a malleable iron or a cast iron. And the big difference there was uh, as each of the process with processes was done, uh, carbon was removed to come up with the material that they wanted. So the least amount of carbon you ended up with a quote steel, a modern day steel with very little carbon. <clears throat> and there were sometimes other materials added to it uh, um, to make it more malleable or less malleable. But cast iron itself was considered the wonder material of the uh, 1800s.
because it could be used in a number of different things. Gray iron was the most popular iron, and that was the first step or the second step in processing. And the way they could tell it was a gray iron was because after it was melted, if it was broken, it would leave a gray break area. And that had to do with the grain structure of the cast iron itself. If it broke and it was white, that meant there was still too much carbon in the iron. But the good thing about white iron was that it was very um, good for abrasive areas. So if they had a plow shear or a certain item that was under a lot of wear, they could use that specific iron for a wear material, where the gray iron was just primarily a structural material. Gray iron could take a lot of uh, temperature swings and a certain amount of stress, but only up to a point. Uh, and that was one of the big things where using it as a uh, material for a, a stove was very good. It was a good choice. Okay, let's go back way beyond the 10 plate stove. If you think back uh, or go back in history, or what type of cooking utensils did you have if you were in pre colonial days? Where did you cook your food? How did you cook your food? In what did you cook your food? You either had an open fire pit and you had a piece of iron that held a piece of wood, uh, meat and you spun the meat over the open fire or you had a huge hearth and you had a kettle rod which allowed you to swing a kettle out, put it on with your ingredients and then swing it back over the fire. That was about the extent of cooking in early days. And usually it involved the center of the house, which was the kitchen. That was also your heat for the house. Uh, so you did have some heat, but usually just in a small area because most of the heat went up the fire flue. So um, in England, they had already started, and in Germany, they had also started uh, thinking about uh, ways to conserve heat in the house. So if you had a chimney, and you wanted to conserve some heat and just do a small amount of cooking or heating water, this sort of thing, you still had to have some sort of open fireplace, but for heat, you had to have a way to conserve the draft in the room. So they came up with what they called a, a five plate stove. This was primarily in England and Germany where they developed this. Five plate stove means there are five castings of gray cast iron and the stove itself is open in the back so there are only five plates, one, two, three, four, five. Five plates to in, in, uh, contain the fire. So you had a, an area to, to burn wood and it was shoved against the fire, or against the uh, the fire brick for the uh, or the stone and it would conserve a lot of the heat in the building because you controlled the draft usually through a small door in the front so that helped conserve um, the heat for the house but it also limited as far as how you could cook you still had a top surface that you could put something on to roast or some of the early ones had an opening where they had a bowl or a kettle that, that was able to be covered and that was a Dutch oven. Now that was early. Um, in Holland and in uh, England and Germany this is where most of these stoves were manufactured and uh, in the colonies uh, they actually had to import them. So the very early stoves were a five plate stove. To help things even more and heat even better, what they did was move the stove away from the chimney, install a, a stove pipe to the chimney, and add another plate. That became a six plate stove or what they called a box stove. The early ones were called a jam stove because it was jammed against the, the chimney. Uh, so what happened was 
they still had an issue with well how do you cook something unless you have a kettle on top or you have a Dutch oven type arrangement um, there was a fella named Benjamin Thompson he was, was born in the mid 1700s um, at a very early age about 14 he was um, schooled in the local schools but walked to nearby Cambridge and would listen to uh, lectures in Cambridge. He was very bright. Um, he married a, an elder, elderly woman. Uh, he was 19 and um, they had a number of children and he was a British sub, uh, sympathizer during the revolutionary period. So what happened was he decided uh, to move to England right around the time of the, the American Revolution. And he, he studied over there and also became uh, ver verse, or versed in uh, thermodynamics and also heat transfer. And one of the things he invented was what, call, what they called the Rumford stove. He was intrigued with how the heat was transferred to metal and he, op he developed a, a cylinder in an open hearth where you could put a roast of a pig or some other item in there so the heat would be concentrated, it would cook the food and you wouldn't have to have the issue with the, the fire problem. It also involved controlling draft through the fireplace so you could help conserve heat. Um, right around the same time Benjamin Franklin was also involved in uh, developing the Franklin stove. He was also interested in conserving heat in the houses at the time. Uh, so the Franklin stove was involved in uh, how the, the heat was moved through the stove and then up through the chimney. So there was a plate which um, controlled the, sm the smoke and held more heat and as a result the stove itself would be much warmer and, and transfer heat. All right, on to the 10 plate stove. So this is a casting, as I showed you before. Um, the casting was done with a pattern, and what they did was add four extra plates. So that's two more doors and two more plates inside, which allowed you to use this as a Dutch oven or a, a early baking oven. So you could put items in here. The stove, the stove itself would burn the wood in the lower chamber. The smoke would go around the cooking area and then out through the chimney. So this was your very first cook stove. And 10 plates because it was made out of 10 pieces of cast iron. Now if you take a look at this, piece of uh, cast iron here, you notice that I have some of it painted a silver color. This was actually wrought iron. All these items were made by the local blacksmith. The cast pieces were all made at the foundries and using a, a, a sand cast process. And then each of the items was assembled to each particular plate. And then the rivets, uh, again, were all made uh, by the blacksmiths in the area, heated and then pounded, and there was no welding or anything as such at the time except forge welding where you actually melted two pieces of metal together. So you have to think about all the work that's involved here. Take a look at the detail that this iron worker did. The, your, local your local blacksmith was an artist. Take a look at all these items, all done by hand. Same thing with the pins in the castings. So each of the pieces of wrought iron were added to the cast iron. Along with other items that were made at the time. Think about all the nails that you buy today. These were all made by hand by the iron worker or the blacksmith. Think about the railroads at the time. Each of the spikes for the railroad tracks were made by hand. Okay, how did they make cast iron from the pig iron? 
here again, here again, here's a piece of iron ore in a rough condition right here, or the, the very rough state. What they did was, after they had the pig iron produced, they would make patterns. Now the pattern for each of the plates, if you take a look at this, this is plate number seven. So out of a 10 plate stove, there are 10 plates. So each of this, these cast pieces were made from a pattern. Now the pattern was either carved out of wood or after the original was, was made, the pattern maker, which it's, itself was a, his job making these intricate designs. If you look at this, it's probably, you would call this Victorian. So they added some filigree to the, the items to make it fancy for your house. If you take a look at these stoves, all the filigree on the side here, the front and back, rather than very plain. Sand casting was done by using river sand mixed with clay, wet it down after they, they uh, uh, sieve it or run it through what they called a riddle, which was a, a sieve to make it very fine and they would make it into just the right consistency when you could take it and break it and it was a sharp break. So here again, your sand guy was very uh, crucial as far as making a sand mold. They would take and start out with what they call, now this, is a, this is a fancy box. This is a pattern box that was used later on in production. But what they used was a two-part box. The very first ones were done on just a bed of sand, where they would put the pattern, place it into the, into the sand for very flat items that didn't require any kind of special shape or anything like that. Then they would just pour the iron into the sand. And once it cooled, they would take the item out and dress it up as good as they could. When it got to these fancy items where they were curved, or they had an inside and outside surface, then what they used was what they called a mold box. The bottom of the box was called the drag, the top was called the cope. I guess so they could cope with it. The, the drag was because they had to drag it around after they filled it with sand. So what they would do is they put a bottom plate, now this is too small, but they put a bottom plate in, they would pack this with sand, and tamp it till it was very hard. Then they would take, put the pattern into the box, tamp it down some more, then remove the pattern. Then they would put a either a, a silicon or silica or graphite, and that was your mold release. So that what that would do would be once the casting metal was put in there, it would allow it to release from the sand and not stick. Then they would do the opposite side of the item in the top box, or the cope. So that would be the other side of the item. Again, put sand in, put this in, pack it real tight, usually this was the opposite side. They put the item in and then pack it in, and that would show the obverse or the reverse side of it. Very carefully remove it again. Put the bowl release in there. But then at the same time, after they put this together, they would have to put two holes in to the pattern. And one would allow the, the molten metal to come in. The other one would allow the air to escape and make a good mold. So then once that was done, they'd remove these, they'd have a block of sand, and then they would pour the, the hot metal into it until it came out the other side, let it cool, and then break the sand apart. And they'd end up with the piece of casting, very rough, with these stalks sticking out, which they called sprules.
they would break those off and then do hand machining for the final item. Drill holes where they needed to and then add the wrought iron pieces. So it was very labor intensive to make one of these stoves. This is about the standard size that most of the 10 plate stoves were constructed. About 16 to 18 inches wide, approximately about, I'd say two and a half feet long. This one was fancy because it had a shelf in the front here. You could actually put a pot on here, whatever, or you could put pots on top. You control the draft through this little door in the front for your uh, how hot you want it to burn. Um, as, as metallurgy improved, the very early furnaces uh, that made the pig iron were set up uh, primarily by local guys who had a huge iron ore deposit right near them or, or right around them and they owned a large tract of wooded land because those were two of the big items that they needed to produce the cast iron. You needed the ore, uh, limestone, and also uh, charcoal. Coal became very important and it burns a lot hotter and it's a lot more uh, efficient. It was mined just north of us and it would transport down through the Lehigh River and the railroads became very important too because uh, they also uh, uh, became one of the big transporters for coal. This um, ten plate stove was located in a scrapyard in one of my digs and I came across it because most of it was fairly complete except for legs and uh, Craig Bartholomew had a set of legs which fit this stove perfectly which was amazing because you think of how many of these were scrapped over the years because by the 1880s this was no longer a, a popular way to heat a home. This size stove was very popular for most uh, small homes because it didn't take up a lot of space. It allowed them to cook in uh, a certain amount in the kitchen. Uh, it allowed them to heat the uh, major area in the house and uh, they could do other things like uh, boil water, this sort of thing, uh, do some baking, etc. Um, this particular stove was made right around 1840. Uh, done by the Lehigh Furnace, which was actually part of the Balliot Helfrick Furnace, which was started in 1827. Um, they were in partnership, and uh, Helfrick had passed away after a number of years after they bought a large tract of land together. Uh, so Balliot took it over, and this was done at the foot of the Blue Mountain near Slatedale. Um, they also had a place located in the East Penn area. Um, they also had several uh, ore mines right along this area, right outside McCungie. And, and uh, they uh, produced a lot of pig iron for um, the Crane Iron Works in Catasauqua. And by uh, eight, like I said earlier, the 18 by 1880s, uh, this became a less popular type of uh, cooking device and by that time when you went into a, some of the farm kitchens you saw a huge cast iron stove which either burned coal or wood. To care for your cast iron items, for instance a stove or your skillet, it's very important that you heat them occasionally and season them. Uh, cast iron skillets uh, shouldn't be allowed to rust. If they if they do rust, you want to clean them off and then re-season them with using an oil. On a stove, you don't want to paint them. You want to brush them down if they become rusty for for um, misuse or disuse, and use wax and work it into the pores. So then, when the heat uh, is uh, generated again when the stove is run, it's not going to give off noxious gases. If you're interested in, in uh, this type of uh, metal work or casting, uh, so you can go online or you can uh, go to the local library and get a lot of information involving uh, um, 
the uh, Makanji in uh, um, uh, southern Pennsylvania area. And Hopewell Furnace, located in Elverson, Pennsylvania, has a whole display and uh, actually um, I believe they do a, an operation down there where they actually show it being done. And that gets involved in, in sand casting and the, pro the process, etc. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of uh, information uh, regarding the, quote, 10-plate stove.